This is FRM Part 1, Book 3, and this chapter ought to be called something other than interest rates. That's kind of a dull name because there's a lot of exciting stuff in here. Duration, convexity, bond pricing. Let's go ahead and look at the learning objectives. Describe treasury rates, LIBOR and repo rates. Uh, calculate future values using different compounding frequencies. That'll be a pretty basic uh, assignment for us. Convert interest rates. Calculate theoretical price of a bond. Derive forward rates. Talk about forward rate agreements. Those things are pretty cool. And then duration and modified duration and dollar duration and convexity. And we're going to use all that stuff to compute the change in a bond's price uh, given those measures of interest rate risk. So let's get right to it. Of course, what do we know about the United States federal government? We know that the United States federal government spends a lot of money, which means that it needs to either A, raise a lot in tax revenues or borrow a lot. And so we, we know that it does both of those things. And so uh, treasury yields or treasury rates uh, are the rates earned by investors in instruments used by the federal government to borrow in its own currency. So treasury bonds, there are treasury notes in there as well, and treasury bills. These things are considered to be default risk free because if you buy a one month treasury bill or a 30 year treasury bond, you are absolutely guaranteed to receive any interest payments if you're due those interest payments during the life of the bond or the note. And then you're guaranteed to receive the par value or the maturity value of the bond. Now, the idea behind that is that the market perceives these treasury securities to be risk free. So therefore, they must be. Now, one of the things that treasury yields are important for is to establish benchmarks for nominal risk free rates of interest. Other rates include the London Interbank Offered Rate, which is the rate between and among large financial institutions ranging over five currencies and tens and tens of economies throughout the world. And this is the rate at which these uh, financial institutions will lend each other over the short term. Pro probably overnight is the most common LIBOR rate, although uh, there's a weekly LIBOR. There's uh, one month and two month and three month and six month and 12 months. There's probably other LIBOR rates out there, but those are those are the most common ones. And so it's a most widely used benchmark for short term lending. But as we know from our conversations in derivative securities, it's really important for pricing things like swap contracts. Now, repo rates, these are the yields or the rates that are implied on repurchase agreements. So let's suppose that I own a treasury bill today and it matures next week or in two weeks or a month from now. And the price of this treasury bill is $9,950, let's say. And so what could I do? I could hold on to this thing uh, until it matures in a week or two, whatever I said, and then I'd get my $10,000 back or, or I could sell it today. And I could raise capital, right? I could get that 99.50 or whatever that number was that I said I could get that and I could do something else with it. And then what I can do is I can agree to repurchase that treasury bill either tomorrow or next week or whenever, but mostly tomorrow. And I could agree to repurchase it for uh, $9,952. And so the cool thing about this is that if overnight rates go way up, the price of that treasury is going to go down. And I'm going to have to pay, what did I say, $99.52. And the security is only worth, let's say, $98.48. And so I lose out on that. But that's really what the repo market is. It's, uh, it's for short-term funding, but it's also a bet on short-term interest rates. Uh, there is credit risk, of course. Uh, how about the learning objective that asks us to look at compounding frequencies? And there, there's some future value formulas there. That first one is assuming discrete compounding. 
And then the second one is continuous compounding. And rather than go through and explain every part of that formula, why don't I just give you an example here? So let's suppose that we have $100 invested today and the 10% is the relevant annual interest rate over four years. Now let's use that top formula there, future value, assuming annual compounding is just going to be the $100 times one plus the 10%. Now, M in this case is just one year, so 10 divided by one is 10. So we've got 1.10 raised to the fourth power. So that future value is 146.41. If we assume quarterly compounding and monthly compounding, notice what we're gonna do. We're gonna chop that 10% into different components. In quarterly compounding, we're gonna chop it into four parts. In monthly compounding, we're gonna chop it into 12 parts. So for quarterly compounding, 10 divided by four is two and a half, so it's $100 times the 1.025, and then raised to the four quarters per year times the four year investment horizon, that gives us 16. So that gives us a future value of 148.45. And of course, we would have expected that to be greater than the 146 because we're earning interest on top of interest more frequently, right? And then when we do monthly compounded, we'll chop that 10% into 12 components. So, that, so that's the uh, uh, 833 you see there. So we take 100 times 1 plus 0, 0, 833, raised to the four years times 12 months a year gives us 48 and we get 148.93. So notice what's happening to the future value. It is increasing. So we go from 146 to 148.45 and then to 148.93. So it is increasing, but it is increasing at a decreasing rate, which means that sooner or later we're going to bump our heads into some ceiling. And so what could I do next? I could have had a D there. I could have done weekly compounding and then I could have done daily compounding and then hourly compounding and then minutely compounding. Minutely, is that a word? And then secondly compounding. And what would have happened to that future value? Boy, it wouldn't have gone up by much. It might have gone up to 148.97 and then 149.01 and 149.13 or something. But sooner or later, you have to hit a ceiling. And that's with continuous compounding. Continuous compounding assumes that interest is compounded at every instant of every day. So blink your eyes. Like, look, every time you blink your eyes, well, that's not enough. Interest is compounded even faster than blinking of the eyes. And so we have to use a, a different function. We've got to use our little e to the x button on the calculator. So we'll take uh, the e raised to the 0.1. Make sure you do this in decimal form, 0.1 times 4 years times $100, and that's 149.18. So think of continuous compounding. That 149.18 is the maximum future value that you can get if you have $100 today invested at 10% over four years. You can't get more than 149.18 under those conditions. Now, how about uh, kind of going backwards here? Let's suppose that we want to know what the interest rate is what the continuously compounded interest rate is uh, given some kind of a discrete compounding rate. And so rather than go through those formulas there at the top, much like I did back in that previous page, so clearly my ABCD examples, they, they illustrate those formulas there. Let, let's go ahead and do this again. And I'm, I'm not going to take up more of your time than I need, so let's just do 10% annual rate. Um, if we assume annual compounding, then the continuously compounded rate is going to be um, the natural log of 1 plus the interest rate, 1.1 times, times the 1, right? It's annual, so you just have the 1 year. That gets us a continuously compounded uh, rate of return of 9.531%. If we assume monthly compounding, take the natural log of 1.00833, right? That's the 10, 10% divided by 12. And then we've got an M of 12, so we need to multiply it by 12. That gets us a continuously compounded rate of 99.55. And then you can, you can go backwards as well. So if you're given that continuously compounded 
rate, assuming annual or com monthly compounding, then you can revert back. And that's what I did in those final two block points down there. And that should be pretty straightforward. All right, theoretical price of a bond using spot rates. All right, remember what spot rates are. Spot rates are the yield on a zero coupon bond maturing in years one and two and three and four. All right, so the price of the bond, what do we know about financial securities? Any financial security is equal to the present value of the promised payments. So what kind of promises do executives of corporations and government agents make to the bondholders. The promise is the same thing. Uh, the borrowers, the bond issuers, the governments and the corporations, they say to the bondholders, hey, lend me a bunch of your money today and I promise to pay you interest. We call that a coupon payment. And I promise to pay you principal. And so here is the formula, theoretical bond pricing formula which is, and notice the coupon payments has that big sigma there. That just means we're going to add a bunch of things together. And then the principal amount, that future value is going to be $1,000 or $100 or $10, depending on what you assume is the par value. Now, what I've done for you here in the second slide is to go ahead and uh, compute the price of a bond. So look at my, my first block point underneath the formula. Let's suppose we have a two-year bond. We have a coupon rate of 10% and the spot rate is 11%. Let's just, for simplicity's sake, let's just assume a, a flat yield curve. So we'll just assume that that's a, a constant yield to maturity, a constant spot rate over those two periods. What we're going to do here, notice in the formula up above that we're chopping some things in half, most bonds almost all bonds, they don't have to, but most bonds pay interest twice a year. So the 10% coupon rate, and I'm going to do this based on a par value of $1,000. We take 10% of $1,000, that gets us $100, chop that in half. All right, so there's the coupon payment. So look at the second block point. I have the price is equal to $50. That's the coupon payment, 100 divided by 2 times, and we're going to do our little e raised to the, and you ready? We're going to raise it to the spot rate times the number of periods. So we're discounting this back one period. That's, of course, why we make put the negative sign in front of the 055. And then we're just going to do the same thing for all four coupon payments. Remember, we're going to get we're going to buy the bond today then we're going to get a coupon payment in six months, a coupon payment in 12, a coupon payment in 18, a coupon payment in 24 months. And then we're going to receive the principal payment. And so notice the only difference between the first $50 and the subsequent $350 is that we're going to discount them back two periods and then three periods and then four periods. And so note the final block point I have, uh, I have the sum of those present values. So the price is equal to the first $50 present value is 47. The second one is 44, then 42 and then 40. And then the present value of the $1,000 is 802. And if you sum those things, you get a bond price of 977.15. And of course, we knew this bond was going to sell at a discount because coupon rate is 10. The spot curve is above the coupon rate. So essentially what has happened is that yields have gone up or yields are expected to go up, which must mean that the bond is going to sell at a discount. I wish there were a faster way to do this, but, uh, but there's not. Now, sometimes you know, back here in this example, what we do is we have a borrower like a corporation or a government who issues a bond and they're going to borrow some capital today. Right. So they know what their borrowing costs are. They know what the yield to maturity on the bond is. They know what that spot curve is going to look like. Right. But sometimes, sometimes. And this happens with corporations, but not uh, I'm sorry, this happens with governments, but not nearly as regularly as it happens with corporations, is that sometimes corporations know that they're going to borrow in the future and they want to kind of worry about that interest rate risk. And so they want to lock into a rate in the future. All right. So that's what we're kind of doing here. 
Let's look at forward rates from a set of spot rates. What we're interested in asking ourselves the question is, notice that if we wanted to borrow for one year, we'd have to pay 1.2, we'd have to pay 1.5 and 1.9 and 2.4 if we wanted to borrow in two, three, or four years from now, those are the spot rates, right? But what if we wanted to borrow one year from today and we wanted to take out a one year loan? Oh my word, well, how do we know that? How can we predict what that future borrowing rate is going to be? Well, we use the spot curve to do that. And so that's all we're gonna do. We're gonna take the average, uh, we're gonna take the average between time period one and time period two, and we're gonna back out so that we can see what that expected future spot rate is going to be, and we're gonna call that a forward rate. So that's what I have in the example down there, the one year forward rate. Uh, is going to be, boy, we're going to do in the numerator, we're going to do 1.015. There's the two rate. So if we if we invest in a two year security, we'll get one and a half percent each year. So we square it, right? So 1.1015 times 1.015 divided by the spot rate uh, for one year. So think about what that ratio is. We've got the two year rate in the numerator plus one, we have to compound it. We got the one year rate in the denominator, plus one, right? We have to compound it. One squared and one is raised to the first power. And so notice what we're assuming there. We're assuming that one year from now, that, that uh, one year borrowing rate is gonna be 1.8%. Now back to this concept of, oh my gosh, well, let's go ahead and say, well, here, let me go back here. We know that if we wait a year, we, were, we will expect to borrow at 1.8%. But what if we don't wanna wait a year? What if we're worried that a year from now, that rate is gonna be 1.9% or 2.5% or 12.18%. So even though we know what that forward rate is going to be, that forward rate is just an estimate based on an entire yield curve of spot rates. And we know that the economy can change over time. So clearly there's no way that the economy is going to remain exactly the same today that it will be a year from now. So the rates are probably gonna be either above or below that. So what we can do is we can enter a forward rate agreement. So look at this definition, an agreement between two parties to lock in an interest rate for a specified time period starting on a future settlement date. Now, of course, this is a derivative security, so there's going to be no capital changing hands today, but we need some kind of a reference amount, and that reference amount is called the notional amount. And so note what these two parties are doing. The two parties are agreeing to either borrow or lend, right? And they're agreeing to borrow or lend at, at a specific agreed upon rate. And that's noted as R sub K in those formulas there. Now, once that year goes by or whatever that time period is, we just look in the spot market and we see, oh, what's the interest rate? And we compare the two. And if the rates are way, way up here, then one party wins. If the rates are way, way down here, then the other party wins. So here's a little bit of a chronology of what happens. We, we have this trade date, so we're agreeing to trade. And then in two days, there, there's the spot date. So all these terms then are finalized. So then we wait a while, and then there's this fixing date where we look out at the spot market and we see what's going on. And then two days later, two days later, we settle. And of course, we're just gonna settle uh, based on the difference between the interest rate times the notional amount. Look in the second block point I put there, there are no principal cash flows. And since we settle on the settlement date, we cash settle, there, there is no need for a loan. I mean, both parties can go out and get a loan at the current spot rate if they want to, uh, but then they'll take the cash out of the derivative market. Remember I told you in a previous chapter that 99, 98% of all derivatives are cash settled. All right, so here is that formula from the previous page. We've got two firms, firm A and firm B, and we're going to, each one of these is going to enter into a uh, forward rate agreement so that one party is going to win and one party is going to lose. So let's take a look at an example here. 
a German bank and a French bank enter a semi-annual FRA, the German bank will pay a fixed rate of 4.2% and receive the floating rate on a principal or a notional amount of 700 million euros. All right, there's that forward rate, 5.1%, risk-free rate uh, on the German mark is 6%. Uh, what is the value of the FRA contract between the two marks? So there we're going to use the formula. Notice the uh, notional amount, 700 million euros. We're going to multiply that by, you ready? By the difference between that fixed rate that was agreed upon all the way back in the old days, right? 4.2% and the 5.1%. And then we're going to take the present value of that. 6% uh, over that one time period, right? It's just one month. Uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, one six month period. And we're going to do that. Uh, that's the 0.5 there. And so there's the value of the contract, uh, almost 3 million euros. Now notice what we were talking about in both that forward rate and that forward rate agreement. We were borrowing or we were lending and we were concerned about interest rates going up too far and going down too far. This is called interest rate risk. And so I teach my students all the time. I say, look, you got to identify the risk. You've got to quantify the risk and then you have to manage the risk. So we can we can manage the risk with those forward rate agreements. We can identify interest rate risk, but there are some other there are some other measurement tools that are going to help us especially as it relates to things like bonds and maybe even swaps. And so this brings us to the concept of duration. Now, I always ask my students the following question. I look at them and I say, all right, let's suppose that uh, I'm a company and I issue a bond and I issue a 10 year bond. And I look at them and I say, all right, how long will it take for you to receive your principal amount on a 10 year bond? And they look at me like, oh, OK, Jim, we're not quite sure what you're asking. Isn't the obvious notion? Isn't it 10 years? All right. So we know that the time to maturity on a 10 year bond. Is 10 years. But what else do we know? We know that if we buy that bond today and we hold it until maturity, we're going to probably earn that yield to maturity on the bond. But what happens if we sell it in year five or year six or year eight? What happens if we're forced to sell that bond for some liquidity reason or some market event related reason? Then how much money are we going to get back? Well, the answer is, oh, if interest rates go way up, then we'll have to sell the bond for a lower price. If interest rates go way down, then we'll get to sell the bond for a higher price. So there's some question about whether or not we're going to get that money back at a certain time. And that brings us to the concept of duration. Duration is a weighted average time to maturity. Oh, that sounds really, really cool. Now, what do we know? We know that there's this inverse relationship between bond prices and its yields. When when yields go up, bond, bond prices fall. And so duration is going to be a measure of how sensitive that bond price is to changes in yields. I mean, it might be. I mean, think about a bond. I'll just make some extreme example. Think about a bond that has a yield to maturity of 10 percent and the yield changes to 12 percent. But the bond was priced at a thousand and the bond price then after the yield change is only nine hundred and ninety nine dollars. Well, that's a very low interest rate risk bond. Probably not uh, mathematically possible to have such a bond. But that's what dur duration measures. It measures the sensitivity of bond prices to changes in yields. So let's go ahead and do a couple of calculations here. Let's first compute the duration of a bond. So here's a bond, 6% coupon rate, annual payments. That's important, annual payments. Uh, three years to maturity. Bond has a yield to maturity of 8% and it's priced at 95% of par value. The Macaulay duration. Now remember what I said to you, Dura uh, Macaulay duration and duration in this instance is a weighted average time to maturity. So notice what we're doing. Notice we have 6 divided by 1.08 and 6 divided by 1.08 and 6 divided by 1.08 all raised to the 1, 2 and 3 power. And then we're multiplying it by 1, 2 and 3, right? So the first payment and the second payment and the third payment. And so then we're dividing it by three. So it's a weighted average. It's an average, but it's weighted by the cash flows, the discounted cash flows. 
So we're getting six the first year, we're getting six the second year, we're getting six the third year, but we're also getting 100 during that third year. All right, so if you do the math, you get 2.82. And those are years, remember, duration is expressed in years. So this bond matures in three years. It's time to maturity is three years, but its duration is 2.8 years. Its weighted average time to maturity is 2.82 years. And that, that is the time period under which the bondholders are indifferent between interest rate rises and interest rate fall, interest rate drops. A couple of things here down at the bottom. Notice I have that for zero coupon bonds, the duration and the time to maturity are going to be the same number. That ought to make sense because what happens is that the investor receives those coupon payments, $6 in this case, and then reinvest those. And what those reinvested coupon payments do is they compute and they aggregate and they compound to some higher terminal value of the bond. And so the bondholder can get his or her money back sooner than that three year time to maturity. Now, on an exam, you might be asked to compute the duration of the bond because that's consistent with the learning objectives, and you can do it this way. Um, and for a shorter term bonds, it's probably not that cumbersome, but I always give this formula that I'm showing you in red to my students. And of course, you know, my students get to use this formula on the exam, so it's relatively easy for them. Um, but it might be worth trying to memorize this thing in red. It's, it's a formula that's gonna give you an estimate, but it's actually a pretty good estimate. And so notice that you get 2.828 instead of 2.82, but uh, either way, you can compute the duration of a bond. Now, that Macaulay duration gives us the weighted average time to maturity. What we're interested in is how much will the bond price change when yields change? And that's the modified duration of a bond. And it's really simple to go from Macaulay to modified duration. All you do is take the Macaulay duration, which is what we've been talking about and calculating over the previous couple of slides, and you divide it essentially by one plus the yield to maturity on the bond. So the modified duration of our bond, our three-year bond in the previous example is 2.61%. Now there is an exam tip there at the bottom and make sure that you're familiar with the terminology. Uh, test creators, they like to throw trickerations at you all the time. Make sure you read the question and determine whether or not you're given Macaulay or whether you're given modified. Now, of course, if you have to calculate it, like back here, you're gonna compute, you're gonna compute Macaulay first, and then you're gonna to have to make the compounding adjustment to get to modified. Uh, how, about, how about dollar duration? What we're interested in knowing is the following. You know, we have a bond, and that bond sells for a specific price. What you're interested in knowing is suppose interest rates, suppose yields go up by a really, really small point, a really, really small amount. How about one basis point, which is 0.01%, right? So this is reasonable because what do we know? Bond yields and bond prices, you know, they go up and down during the course of the day. And so they change in increments of one basis point. That yield can change in increments. So we'd like to know what is going to be the dollar value. So dollar duration. And what we do in, in fixed income security management, we call this the dollar value of a basis point. And what we do is take the dollar duration and notice dollar duration is just modified duration times the price of the bond times the change in yield. So uh, let's switch gears just a little bit. I have a different example. Suppose we have a 10 year bond. Coupon rate is 4%, yield to maturity 4.5%. Suppose the price is 960.44. Of course, that's based on a par value of $1,000. There's the modified duration of 8.04%. And comma, by the way, I went to the, uh, I went to the modified duration uh, calculator. I went to that web page and I just threw those numbers in there. And so, uh, so I got that modified duration. I kind of took a shortcut. 
And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the 8.04, multiply it by the 960, then multiply it by one basis point, which is going to be our reference change in yield, 0 0.0001, and we get about 77 cents. So what that means is that if we buy this bond today for 960.44 and the yield to maturity on the bond increases to, right, it, it's, currently it's 4.5, if it increases to 4.5001, then our price will lose 77.22 cents, right? And so it will fall to 959.68. Uh, now, what we were talking about in, in our, the previous few minutes of our duration conversation is for what are known as option-free bonds. Option-free bonds are just straight bonds in which there is a fixed coupon rate over the life of the bond, and there is no opportunity for the bondholders to do something, and there's no opportunity for the issuers to do anything. These are called option-free bonds. But what do we know? We know that there are lots of bonds that are callable and there are lots of bonds that'll, that are puttable. So it's very complex when you have a callable bond and a puttable bond because the convexity, and we'll talk about convexity here in just a couple of slides, the convexity of these uh, bonds with embedded options uh, makes for it virtually impossible to compute the duration like we did in those previous slides. I mean, you can do it, but it doesn't have a lot of, a me a lot of meaning. So what we do is we call, calculate something called effective duration. So here's the first thing. The only time you really care about effective duration is when you have a puttable bond or a callable bond. And there's a good formula for effective duration. All you're going to do is take the difference between the two prices in the numerator. And so that is the bond value if interest rates fall and the bond value if interest rates go up. So when interest rates fall, the bond price will be higher. When interest rates go up, the bond price will be lower. So, so that numerator is always going to be positive. And then you multiply it by, by kind of like um, something that looks like the dollar duration of a bond, but it's not, it's not quite the dollar duration of a bond. But we're going to say two times the current price of the bond times the change in yield. All right, so I have an example down there at the bottom, and this will illustrate the effective duration. So here's, here's a callable bond, let's say. Price is 981.26. If the yield rises by 10 basis points, the new price will be 975. If it falls by 10 basis points, the new price will be 987. So what is the effective duration of this callable bond? We take the 987, subtract the 975, we get 11 something, maybe close to $12, and divide that by two times the current price of 981 times the 0 0.001, and that gives us a duration, an effective duration of almost six years. So note what's really cool about effective duration is that you don't need to know the maturity date on the bond because it doesn't really matter what the maturity date on a callable bond is, as soon as that call moves to in the money or near the money or is callable, well, then bond prices do something really, really crazy. So this could be a 10-year bond. It could be a 20-year bond. It could be a 100-year bond. It's probably not a 100-year bond, but ah, how about convexity? So duration is the first derivative of the pricing formula. Convexity is then the second derivative. All right. Notice I have the relationship between yields on the horizontal axis and bond price on the vertical axis. And so note, a one-year bond, boy, does that look like it's a downward slope? Oh my gosh, it's almost a line, right? And it's kind of, it's a little downward sloping. Of course, it's going to be downward sloping. So that is a flat relationship picture, short-term bond. But notice a 30-year bond, oh my gosh, that has convexity, that has curvature. So the one-year bond is kind of linear, which means that the first derivative duration is going, to, is going to be able to handle lots and lots of the effects of changes in prices due to changes in yields. But for longer-term bonds, we need to worry about convexity. That's why I have those two circle points there at the top. Longer maturity bonds are more sensitive to changes in yields than shorter maturity bonds. 
which means that interest rate risk is way larger for longer maturity bonds. I think I gave you the example, boy, this is lots and lots of chapters ago. Uh, back in the 1990s, Walt Disney woke up one morning and said, I would like to issue a 100-year bond. Disney has a 100-year bond that has you know 80 years left until it matures. So what kind of convexity does that bond have compared to, let's say, a one-year treasury bond? All right, so look at, the, uh, look at the pictures there that I have in the graph. I got the three, the two, and the one. So clearly as we go three, two, and one, what happens is that we've got greater levels of convexity and greater levels of interest rate risk. All right, so as the yield goes down, the duration then goes up. So note what I have in the second the second bullet point, the second circle point there. Um, convexity is a fairly good measure of exactly how bond prices are affected by small changes in interest rates. Now, what's going to happen is that it depends on where we are, uh, where we are on the yield of the horizontal axis. And I have a really good example coming up here in just a second. Now, remember what I said, for small changes in yields, duration is probably going to capture lots of that price change. But depending on where we are on that convexity, on that nonlinear relationship, we're going to have to make a convexity adjustment. Remember what we're trying to do. We want to know when interest rates go up, how much does our bond price fall? We're going to use duration to get some of that, but we are also going to need convexity to give us the full measure of interest rate risk. And so the convexity effect is one half times convexity times the change in the yield squared. Convexity is always positive. It's usually in the hundreds, like 180 or 260 or 420. All right, so look at the green line here. The green line is the actual relationship between yield on the horizontal axis and price on the vertical axis. The straight line is that purple. Uh, sometimes I feel like I'm colorblind, but that's purple. That is what duration is going to give you. So duration, when we're at look look when we're at Y star and we go to Y three and Y two, duration is probably going to give us a pretty good measure of what that new bond price is. But when we move farther out to to Y one and Y four, then duration doesn't tell the full story. All right, so look up at the top part of that formula. The change in price is going to be the duration effect plus the convexity effect. I hope that makes perfect sense. So look, if you're ever asked on an exam to see what is the change in price of a bond and the yield changes from you know 5.1% to 5.11%, the duration effect is probably going to capture all that change in price. But when you go way out, when you go way, way out, you're going to need the convexity effect. And this is a really cool thing. Let's go ahead and look at an example here. Let's say let's suppose we have Canadian dollars, 200 million uh, 200 million in bonds, modified duration of six and a convexity of 120. Uh, term structure is flat. How much does the value of that position change if interest rates increase by 50 basis points? All right, so notice what's happening. We have, we have a 200 million Canadian dollar portfolio, modified duration of six, and so we're worried about yields going up by 50 basis points, okay? Now, this is not good news, right? When yields go up, when yields go up, what's going to happen to the value of our portfolio? It's going to go down. But, but, now before we do the math, if this were the Disney bond, the 100-year bond that had a modified duration of, let's say, 18, wow, we're going to lose a lot of value in our Disney bond. But since our modified duration is only six, we're not going to lose nearly as much. And if this were a one-year treasury bond that had a modified duration of, let's say, 0.8, then we would only lose a small amount. Everybody get that. Larger durations, larger convexities are going to lead to higher changes in price. 
Now, all we're going to do is go back to this formula way at the top, and we're going to compute the duration effect and the convexity effect. So we're going to take the 6, and we put a minus sign in front just to illustrate that inverse relationship. Take the minus 6 times the 200 times the change in yield, so that's 0 0.005. So we're going to lose $6 million because of duration, $6 million Canadian dollars, but, but we're going to gain 300,000, right? So it's 0.5 times the 120 of convexity times the, uh, times the 200 million, that's Canadian dollars times the 0 0.005 squared, right? Uh, so that gets us 300,000. So let me go back here. So we're going from, y star, right? We're going from y star all the way over to y4. Let me go back here because we're going up by 50 basis points. Now, forget about the magnitude here. So we're going way over there. So what the duration effect is telling us is that we're losing, we're losing 6 million, but we're getting an extra, we're getting an extra 300,000 because of the convexity effect. Convexity effect will always be positive. All right, so what does that mean? We're going to lose 5.7 million. So our portfolio now is only worth, uh, what is that? 194.3 million Canadian dollars. That was fun. And that takes us to the end of chapter seven. We'll talk a little bit more about forward and futures prices.